Hello, my name is Frida Badamosi, and I am the Mind the Gap Manager and the US Indies Programmer. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with our uh, with the film Queen of Glory. Uh, before we go into it, I also wanted to let every one of the viewers know that Queen of Glory and Nana are actually our winner of our inaugural uh, Mind the Gap Creation Prize. And we're very excited uh, to like uh, for Nana to have this award. And we'll get into that as well as we talk a little bit about the film. But I would like to introduce uh, Nana Mensa, um, who is the writer, director, and star of Queen of Glory. Uh, so it's many, many hyphens. Um, I kind of wanted you to. Talk. You forgot. You forgot like caterer and <laughs> boom gaffer. I yeah, you know, I did everything. Um, Transpo. <laughs> um, uh, as many of the people probably watching our independent films know, uh, uh, independent films are not easy uh, to necessarily get made. So kind of wanted to talk about your process. Like what was the process in um, this film coming to life, this amazing film coming to life? Oh, thank you, Farida. Um, yes, the process, my goodness. Uh, it started with me having a kernel of an idea uh, of a script that I didn't intend to direct or star in, but I wanted to write and I wrote it. I showed it to my first cousin turned producer, Baf Akoto. And he was like, I think I know the right producer for it. So he linked me up with our other two producers and then we had a producing team. Great, okay, now we need money. So then we started knocking on every single door available and uh, got some money, but not enough money. So we did a Kickstarter. And then we got that money, but we needed even more money. And uh, because no one really tells you that filmmaking is a really expensive hobby slash, slash art form craft. Um, and so I ended up, um, so we had to pause the film, frankly, because we didn't have enough cash. And so then we ended up, um, we took a break and went back to our respective corners. And in that time, we started working, you know, we started like getting work, which was amazing, um, which is what we wanted the film to do for us. Uh, but then um, we kind of had a little bit of money, all of us. So we all pitched in the last bit of money that we needed, finished the film, submitted it to festivals, and then, you know, began touring around the country and, and actually the world, um, starting to tell the story, sharing the story with people. Uh, I, I kind of love that your film kind of, embodies that indie spirit of like just kind of collectivism which I I'm always looking for when I look at films uh one of the things I also really appreciate about your film is I, I'm a big fan of like New York indie films uh especially like like the Raisin Victor Vargas is in the um art like those films were like the things that kind of brought me to the industry and I loved watching your film because it felt like it had a lot of that that energy. Um, and I kind of wanted to know what were the things that kind of inspired you when you were in the process of writing and creating this? That is a very high compliment. I love raising <laughs> Victor Vargas. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, basically there were two things. There was one that my family, a lot of my family lives in the Bronx. And, um, and it was always really weird to me that when you would say the Bronx, people go, oh you know, or like, you know, <laughs> and that was like, you know, the immediate reaction. But whereas like I, the Bronx to me meant like, it was kind of suburban, you know, and, and there were parks and there were, you know, like it wasn't like this like thuggish, ruggish, you know, thing, at least not the part of the Bronx that I was familiar with. And so, um, so that was one thing. I felt like that part of the narrative was a little bit missing from, uh, from, from the kind of canon of indie films that talk, that, that depict New York. And then after that, I felt very, um, you know, I felt very specific about the story that I wanted to tell because I'm Ghanaian. My parents immigrated here from Ghana. Um, so I'm Ghanaian American, adding another hyphen to the, <laughs> to the, to the cause. Um, but, um, and that was not really represented. I feel like I have so many friends, especially West African American friends who had a very similar experience to mine um, just in terms of finding their own identity, their relationships with their parents, that cultural disconnect. And um, I never really 
saw that explored and I wanted to tell some of that story too. So those were kind of the kernels. Uh, a lot of people ask me if Queen of Glory is autobiographical. It's not at all. Um, I have a great relationship with my dad. My mom is still alive. Um, you know, lots, yeah. But yeah, I don't have a PhD. Um, but I think that there's an emotional truth to it. Uh, and it feels very emotionally true to me um, you know, to not, to be living in between that hyphen, you know, like in, in that, in that middle space and not really knowing where you fit in. You're not quite Ghanaian enough. You're not quite American enough. And, and just kind of exploring that a little bit. I definitely felt that I am also a hyphen Nigerian American. So I watched that movie and I was just like the entire time, like my parents are not run a Christian bookstore, but I knew exactly that experience and that relationship. And I was just like this, this feels like seeing myself, which is often frequently not the case for um, third culture uh, individuals. Um, I kind of wanted to get into the cast. One of the things that I also just really appreciated about the film was that each individual character, even if they were on screen for a short period of time, felt like a whole person. So, and I know that's very much in the writing process, but also in the people you chose to play these roles. I kind of wanted to know how you came about uh, the people you brought into the film. Oh, sure. Um, I got really lucky with this cast. I mean, not including myself, just to be clear. <laughs> I got so lucky with me. Um, no, I got very lucky with this cast. I, it uh, coalesced really beautifully and we have such, uh, and not only was I hiring great actors, but I was hiring good people. And I felt like that was a really big part of, of this tail and um because when you are doing something you know on the lower budget side like really it's all hands on deck and so the fact that everybody was so generous and kind that was really important to me and and really helped to make this happen and make it sing now in terms of actually casting we did work with a casting consultant but also a lot of it was people that we'd either worked with before or we'd seen their work and we wanted to work with them again and so, uh, you know, it just yet, yet another kind of data point for how small this industry is and how you don't want to make enemies because, you know, like all of and we wanted to work with everybody because we had had a great time working with them and we didn't want, you know, anyway. So uh, we, so for example, um, a lot of people have asked me about Pitt, uh, Orlando, uh, that actor's name is Nico Gattuso. He is fantastic. Um, and he plays my, you know, he's like my, my ride or die in the bookstore. You know, he's the manager of the bookstore, which initially we have a bit of a contentious relationship and then it evolves into um, something really quite lovely. And he's actually kind of a proxy for my mother in this film a little mm -hmm. bit, like, a, you know, the mother character. And I, um, and I found him because he had worked with my producers prior on a film called Gimme the Loot, which I saw. Um, I think it came out in like 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought he was so great, stole every scene he was in. And I was like, I want to work with that guy, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, and so and so, so just some of the some of the some of the actors in the film are my real family members. <laughs> I definitely was like, hi, Auntie, can you <laughs> um so that that was that was definitely true. Um, yeah, so we just that's kind of how we found everybody. That's how everybody kind of found the process was us picking up the phone and being like, hey, can you do me a favor and give me a couple of days? You know, uh, Russell G. Jones was who plays Hezekiah. He's the only person I didn't know personally going into it, but I had seen his work in, in readings and workshops and, and plays in New York. And I was like, he's so talented. I would love for him to be a part of it. And so I just kind of cold called him. I got his email address from a friend of a friend and, and, and sent him an email and he said, yes. So it was just kind of like that, we like made it work, you know, that, that way. Um, in terms of uh, the film says, the film has like all these amazing shots and all these like really for me, beautiful moments to see you see on screen, especially like when you're in full, um, the full outfit. I kind of wanted to know what went into some of those moments and like, were they the way you initially imagined them to be? Like, I really love the final moment. Of the, well, not the final moment of the film, but I really do enjoy the final scenes of the film where we're kind of seeing um, what a funeral looks like, which is very different from, I guess, uh, Americans think a funeral look. For me, it was like, oh my God. And then I was like, yeah, they're parties. Um, but like, I think for other people, it must have been like a very interesting way to uh, just to see culture on screen. Did you yeah. feel like, did you feel like, did you feel worried about getting it right on screen or was it more just about telling your truth? I think it was more about 
telling my truth because um I, I mean obviously I wanted to have accuracy I wanted it to be like I wanted Ghanaians to watch it and feel you know like that our culture was being represented um but also like at a certain point you can't make the film or tell the story for other people right it has to be for you um I kind of think you know I've said this before that like art making is kind of like whispering into the void, like, I think life is like this, do you agree? You know, and then like waiting to hear if it comes back, like, I agree, I agree, I agree, you know? And so, so, I, so this is, this is my whisper. This is my kind of like, um, you know, leaning into this, to this moment, to this truth of mine and seeing if it resonates. And so, first of all, it means a lot to, to hear that it resonated with you. And also um, in terms of those shots, in terms of, representing those funerals like I grew up going to those events you know I knew exactly I was like the six-year-old asleep in the corner because like it was 3 a.m and my parents were still dancing you know like that was that's my memory of those are my, that's the, those are some of my dearest fondest memories of childhood and so I um it was very important to me to like represent that uh, and 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 kind of get that bit of it and how it's a party and how that is so different from the Western conception of what a funeral is supposed to look like. I think that was something, um, yeah. Like I remember, you know, like my American friends, I'd be like, oh, I can't this Saturday night, I'm going to a funeral. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, oh, actually, I don't really know who it was. You know, it's like, it's like my mom's, like my mom's friend's friend or my mom's cousin, somebody who I've never met, but we're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're going to dance. And like my Western friends are like, like, what does that mean? Um, and so I was like, oh, huh. I guess that's different, you know, but you don't know, you know, you don't know when you're in the community, you don't really understand how, how, but anyway, I digress. I'm not answering your question. Um, I think, I think the shots um, were really important to me to kind of be steady. The, the, the phrase that I kept using in, in the room, in the, on set would be a steady hand in the midst of madness. Like I, I wanted, I wanted things to be playing out uh, like and us to just be watching it and sometimes that means there would be a dip in energy or a dip in something but it was still really important to me to like just hold and 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 hold your attention to this and look at it and really just kind of like unpack it for yourself visually um that was kind of the that was the assignment one of the things that I really enjoyed about this story is that it was ultimately about your journey, um, not necessarily your journey in response to someone else. It was kind of you figuring out who you were. So you do start off the film with a partner that you quickly get rid of. Um, so I kind of wanted to like uh, talk a little bit about like what was it like what went into specifically how you designed your character, your main character's journey in the film. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There was certainly a temptation for there to be a love interest, um, another love interest, like in in uh, um, in the Bronx world, like either somebody that she went to high school with or something. Like it, there were there were early drafts of the scripts that the script that actually were that. Um, and then we realized that that character, although charming and lovely on the page, was a bit of a distraction, and it was taking us away from what Sarah, from who Sarah was trying to be and 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 trying to forge her way um forward after this you know seismic event so uh we cut that character and folk and doubled down on the two worlds the world of the bookstore and home in the bronx and then the world of of columbia and academia and um and and her identity in both of those places and how they you know where they worked and where they didn't work and, and her having to choose uh, between the two. So yeah, she, she, I think it was really important, especially in a script, even though there's a, a lead female character, there are a lot of men in the story. And I think having her, trying to define her in opposition to a man was not the right, it was just not the right move. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the questions I do really enjoy asking during these is always, uh, it might seem a little silly, but like what's a moment from filming or anecdotal story where you felt joy? I imagine there was a lot because it sounds like this was a really great experience for you. But like what's one of those moments where you think back on and you're like either A, this just made me really happy or 
be, this is definitely the right thing that I should be working on. This is, this is it. Um, do you know, honestly, it was, uh, you know, we had to have that hiatus in filming. And when we came back, the first shoot day was a Sunday because that was the only day we could get access to my family's bookstore because that's, it's closed because everybody's at church. So uh, Sundays we shot in the bookstore. And um, so it was Sunday and it was like November and it was cold and it was like seven o'clock in the morning. And I pull up in front of the bookstore and I didn't see anybody. And I was like, oh my God, has there been, there's been a mistake like this, you know, or whatever. Everyone said they were going to come and they didn't come or whatever. I was a little early, actually. I was like, it was like 6.55. So I sat there in it with a lot of anxiety um, in the Bronx, in a car in the Bronx, waiting for people to, and then all of a sudden it was like, it was like, the ends of the end of Ocean's Eleven, like where all the, the characters start coming from different. Areas. They like everyone came and and seeing these people who like had worked on the film. You know, we had to take the pause, came back and helped us finish it and shoot these scenes and 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 make the film what it is. Um, I started crying. I just started. You know, it was like seven o'clock in the morning on in a, no, a winter a wintry November morning, Sunday morning. But I started crying because I was so touched by like everyone believing in this film and showing up and showing up on time and ready to work. And that was, that was, that was a really great moment of joy. I felt like a, you know, cause at the end of the day, you're the leader, you know, like you, and, and people showing up means that they believe in you. They sure as hell are not doing it for the paycheck. So it's like, you know, so they believe in you, they believe in the project. And that was so, um, it made me feel really, really warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, you mentioned your family's bookstore, so it was your family's bookstore? Yes. Oh, yes, was, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my aunt and uncle owned that bookstore for years. And in fact, they shot, they sold it uh, earlier this year. So it was almost as if they were waiting for me to finish the film before they got rid of the bookstore. And so now they are in retirement and I'm very glad for them. <laughs> We are getting close to the end of our conversation together, unfortunately. I, I could talk to you about this film forever. I really did. Uh, it was just really nice to see, I think I said this earlier, but like versions of myself on screen in a way that I, to be honest, don't really have access to regularly. Um, and then, uh, so I guess my other question was your relationship with your uh, high school best friend. Um, like what went into, I, I really appreciated that, A, because we were seeing two versions of an immigrant experience uh, on screen, which is, to be honest, rare. Usually when you get one immigrant story, you get the one, and then everyone else is in contradiction to them. But as a person who's from New York, like that is almost never the actual lived experience of people here. Right. So I kind of wanted to know a little bit about what went into also crafting an immigrant experience that wasn't necessarily your own, but like one that you could engage with as well. Sure, yeah. So. Uh, the character of Tanya is played by an actress. Her name is Anya Migdal. She's also one of the producers on the film. And she um, was, uh, mm. I remember he we met in an acting class and I remember hear her hearing, like I was going in for, for, you know, crackhead number three and dead prostitute number four. And she was going in for also dead prostitute number four or Eastern European sex trafficking victim number two. And, and like, and so we've kind of bonded over the fact that like, you know, we both come from these groups, you know, my being African or, and black, black African and her being Eastern Russian and, and, and Eastern European. And each of us kind of having these, um, tropes that we had to kind of like live with in terms of casting and whether or not we do them, what auditions we got, what we didn't get, you know, what we would decline because we felt like it was too offensive. And, uh, and so um, kind of hearing that I was like, you know, I, I know you, like, I know this woman, I know this character. Um, and I don't think that and it was really, it was important to me, as you say, to not just present one, because the fact of the matter is New York is a melting pot, as everyone likes to say. And you do have, you know, your Nigerian neighbor next to your Ghanaian neighbor, next to your Russian neighbor, next to your Czechoslovakian neighbor, um, or Czech Republic, uh, you know, they separated a lot, but <laughs> Slovakian neighbor. But like, I think, um, and so I wanted to have, 
a little bit of that, you know, it's like all my friends, you know, all my New York friends, my native New Yorker friends all know a little, like a couple words in Yiddish, bodega Spanish and like, you know, like whatever. And it's like, that's, that's so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. It's so important. And I, and I, and I want, I wanted to show some of that. So that was my way of like, uh, you know, kind of having this hat tip to this experience, even though the, the story that we're talking about is very focused. I, I needed those neighbors to kind of bring out a little bit of that flavor of the city, bring the city into, um, in a larger way, into this, into this smaller, smaller tale. Uh, I think that was done very well. Uh, I just, it really felt, I like I said this earlier as well, but like it really felt like a very New York film, like an actual honest tribute to a city that I, to be honest, almost never see accurately on screen, at least not the version I grew up with. Um, so it, I thought that the film did that in an extremely strong way and having that relationship was part of that as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you. And then I guess my final question is, because I have like a minute left before we get completely rushed off. Uh, okay. is to um, ask, what do you hope audiences ultimately take from the film? Ultimately from the film, I hope audiences take from this film that the different ways in which the immigrant experience can be portrayed um, and lived. I think a lot of times you tell a story about people who have come to the United States from elsewhere and there's a lot of trauma involved. And um, that was not my parents' experience. Of course, they had struggles, there was hardship, there was strife, but there was also a lot of joy and there was humor, um, even in the darkest of times. And so I think that was something, I, I, I hope audiences take away the enduring spirit of um, the immigrant and how um, we come from everywhere to make a better life for ourselves here and are fully three-dimensional beings that are that are doing that. You know, we're not statistics, we're not numbers. Um, it's important, to, yeah, I think it's really important to me to just, to just show a little bit more of that humanity, especially in this moment that we're living in right now. Well, thank you so much uh, for your amazing film. And thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you everyone who's watched Queen of Glory. If you haven't watched and you're just watching the Q&A, please go watch the film. Um, and uh, just wanna say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Farida, this is such a pleasure.